Hi, I'm Sean Griffin. Welcome to Kingdom in Context. Hi, welcome back to Honor of Kings on Kingdom in Context. Uh, this week, guys, we are going to be looking at how Enoch is taken to the ends of the earth. He sees fantastic beasts. He's going to see the firmament actually resting on the land itself. We're going to watch as he uh, is shown how the stars come out of their portals and go into their and run their courses and have their names. It's going to be a really fun episode. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm Sean Griffin, and I'm joined here, as always, with my co-host. The Canadian, Ken Heidebrecht. Sean, how are you doing, brother? I'm great. Thanks for uh, thanks for visiting with us uh, over the internets and the interwebs all the way from Nova Scotia in Canada. Yeah, the so North the, Country, Sean. The true North Country, the, the lesser-known province of Canada. To, of course, you know, most... Americans don't have a clue about any of the provinces in Canada. They probably would call them a state, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, yeah. A few times in my life that I've, I've met folks in person from Canada and I'll ask what province do you live in? And they look at me and they're like, what do you know about provinces? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, I'm like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, the best on my Canadian geography, but, uh, I know, you know, that the difference between British Columbia and Saskatchewan. Yeah, and you know so, not to call them states, so that's a that's a big one. And I know that you guys uh, apparently have still allegiance to the the queen. We do. Yeah, I mean that. Yes, Is I that I the, personally do not. But. Yeah, you personally do not. But the political structure up there kind of has a a weird monarchy slash representative republic. Yeah, democracy. we are we're part of the Commonwealth still. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Cool, man. Well, thanks for joining me as always. Um, this is always a lot of fun, guys, here on Honor of Kings. We get to dig into the hidden books of the Bible. These are the books that have been removed from the canon of 66 that we have in our modern uh, our modern day Bibles that you'll get in mostly in North America. And so um, what our initial premise was to start this show was, you know, these are books that used to be in the Bible. They've been taken out in the last few hundred years, and we're trying to figure out why. What's in them, right? What would cause people to want to take them out? And when we look at the stuff that in these extra biblical books or these apocryphal books and we try to figure out you know does it actually relate to the stuff that's in our canon today it does it line up so yeah, it's been a, Sean, it's been a I, lot of fun. I sorry but I, I was gonna say i find that the people that decided to remove books like enoch evidently didn't take the type of time that we are giving to the book um, for studying and researching and testing because it takes a long time sean especially when you're thousands of years removed from you know the one who wrote the book, yeah. um, there's so much to understand and so much to unlearn from from what we're taught in, in modern Christendom that it, it, I just want to know how much time, you know, these people that decided to remove these books relegated towards, you know, testing it out. Yeah, and to me, you know, and of course, then we have to just basically extend to them a basic sense of trust that they knew what they were reading and knew how to line it up with scripture that's in the canon that they decided to keep 
you know, and that's without imposing any nefarious ideals on them, you know, to which the more that we read about some of these things in the extra biblical books, the easier it is for me personally to feel like that maybe some of these, these edits in the, in the actual Bible were not good. Um, and they were done intentionally to keep people from seeing very, very important points of the story that would bring so much clarity to your faith and your walk with, with, uh, with, with Jesus Christ, you know, the son of God, our Messiah, because it not only does it talk about him in various places as we're going to, I think get to probably next week. Right. And in the book of Enoch starts talking about the Messiah a whole lot. And, yeah. um, and so yeah. you'd have to say, well, why would they take this book out when it's got all these descriptions about the Messiah? Yeah, exactly. Sean, that's, that's, uh, that's what I mean. If you're someone who's decided to put yourself in a position to, um, remove books or add books or keep books, you know, what about all these chapters that Enoch is going to reveal to us in episodes coming that clearly talk about the son of God in various titles that he's referred to in the canon of 66. So stay with us guys. It's going to be um, a good episode, this one, but ones to come where we're going to start seeing just how much the son of God is mentioned in the book of Enoch. And it, it blew my mind when I first started to study the book. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, well, Ken, I'll just jump into it if you like. I'll like start reading chapter 33. Yeah, go ahead, brother. All right, guys. Uh, for those following along, we're in Enoch chapter 33. And uh, here is verse 1. It says, And from thence I went to the ends of the earth, and I saw their great beasts, and each differed from the other. And I saw birds also differing in appearance and beauty and voice, the one differing from the other. And to the east of those beasts I saw the ends of the earth, whereon the heaven rests, and the portals of the heaven open. And I saw how the stars of heaven come forth, and I counted the portals out of which they proceed, and wrote down all their outlets of each individual star by itself, according to their number and their names, their courses and their positions, their times and their months, as Uriel, the holy angel who was with me, showed me. He showed all things to me and wrote them down for me. Also their names he wrote for me, and their laws and their companies. Yeah. Um... So, Sean, I think we should probably just give a little bit of context before going forward and expounding on what we think is being referred to here. But yeah. uh, in previous, in our previous episode, Enoch was taken by Raphael um, essentially across the Erythrian Sea. He passes by an angel named Zotuel, who um, translates out to mean little one of God, and uh, goes into the Garden of Righteousness, so where he sees the Tree of Knowledge, right? Or the Tree of Wisdom in some translations. Yeah. So he's just being taken out of that. And um, we believe, I think, Sean, that um, he's on the same kind of plane um, as the previous chapter has been talking about. Yeah, so he's still, he's below the firmament, and as far as we can surmise, and which would be the land we live on today. And that's actually where I wanted just to say for those who are watching, uh, because I know, Ken, you know, this is our 10th episode, and many times... Um, people, this may be the first time they ever see on Earth Kings. You know, they've clicked, they've clicked on it on the YouTube side reel because it looked interesting or whatever. They never heard of it before, and they haven't seen the previous nine episodes, and they haven't seen, you know, I think it was episode three or four where we dissected the firmament pretty thoroughly, and and that's where we see this word heaven is the word for firmament, and that's what Genesis one tells us. Also, the Book of Enoch describes it as it and, and defines it by, and the Book of Jubilees as well. And so we have, you know, when it, I just want people to see that, like in verse two, where it talked about he saw the ends of the earth where on the heaven rests and the portals of the heaven were open. You can just interchange that with the word firmaments. And that's very important for your context of what we're looking at here. So that's why when we say the previous chapter 32, ever the, the places of description that he seemed to be being taken to and seeing the Garden of Righteousness, the Garden of Eden, seemed to be below the firmament during his day. And then now he's going to the ends of the circle of the earth that we live on to see um, these fantastic beasts and actually where the, the firmament itself rests on the land. And we're going to jump into some of the scriptures in the canon about that. That's right. Yeah, Sean, that's actually good. That's a good way to think about, um, you know, the, the firmament and its name as heaven. Um, it's just for every time we see the word heaven to think that it's the structure, the firmament, and that's the name of it. And just kind of like um, when we come across the word sin, we should always keep in mind that sin is the transgression of Yahweh's instructions for how to live, right? And so when we kind of fit that into that word, the way we do with, you know, the heavens or heaven, 
as the, being the firmament, then we get a better picture as to what we're dealing with here each time we we encounter the word. Yeah, absolutely. It's just basic. And this is how we find good context of what we're reading is we have to define our words from, you know, the book itself and how it uses those words. So, yeah, that's good point, Ken. Good point for sure. OK, um, so basically, I, I mean, I don't know what these great beasts are that he saw. But at they're at the ends of the earth. <laughs> so that's yeah, uh, <laughs> he didn't give us any specific detail. It would have been nice to, to to have some more detail around what you know what these beasts look like. Are they different than other beasts that you know were closer inland, or you know even the birds <laughs> are these and different birds as well? This ends of the earth, man. I mean, did he go to the outer edge of the circle of the earth, as as the creation model is described? In the book of enoch uh did he go to you know antarctica which is supposedly land that's covered in ice and we you and i can i think we would safely surmise that all that ice came from the flood which happens after the days of enoch so is it possible that he was going to what we would call antarctica today the land encompassing the outer circle of the earth and saw livable land with beasts on it at the ends of the earth that's interesting to think about sean that very well could have been yeah yeah because you know how they've basically there's mountains and apparently even in near one of the military bases in antarctica there's a warm spot so there's a fresh warm water pond or whatever and there's lush green trees and bushes all growing around and everything and it's an actual little warm area that's you know it's kind of strange because the rest of it's surrounded by ice you know yeah um so the point is uh greenery vegetation and greenery and normal looking landscape can grow in Antarctica if it was just a tad bit warmer. <laughs> That's right. But with all that ice, it, it creates this perpetual, you know, wintry conditions down there. It makes it very difficult for anything to live besides the penguins. Yeah. And that's so. that's smart to keep in mind that this is a pre-flood context, right? This is yeah. before the, the earth shifted and the continents did their thing, right? So this guy has uh, a ton of um land to explore basically all these we see all these chapters he's taken here and there and here and there and we're like well what's that i don't i don't recognize that i don't see that the entire world after the you know during the, the constant excuse me during the events of the flood the entire world was completely scarred or changed in shape you know it got a makeover for good or bad i don't know but it definitely changed in shape as far as the way it would look if you're in a high altitude balloon and you could see down at many different land masses, you know, before the flood, in my opinion, probably would look very different. And I don't think all that ice was there um, in Antarctica that covers it all. Because in some places they claim it's like almost two miles thick in Antarctica. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it says in Genesis 7, the springs of the deep came forth and the water poured down through the through the gates of the firm and above the floodgates. So that's a lot of extra water added to this creation that's not there while we read this passage in the book of Enoch right now. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. and that water turned to ice. And, and so that's my theory is that he's actually in, if he's at the ends of the earth, whereupon the heaven rests, the ferment's actually touching the ground. <laughs> then that's my theory is that he's in Antarctica before ice was there, basically. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, you know, how, how are the animals that he's seeing in verse one? Um, how are they there? I mean, in Jubilees, it talks about, the animals were in the garden and then when adam and eve sinned you know they obviously got the boot and the animals were all scattered across the lands right yeah yeah and so i'm just wondering like they must have migrated quite far right because if in the days of enoch he's seen them on, like right near where the firmament <laughs> kind of ends and and touches up against the circle of the earth they're even out that far let me actually go to that real quick because i believe jubilees actually says um it actually explains that word or explains that that moment as far as the animals themselves yeah. let me see if i can find it real quick um, yeah it mentions them going to their lands that were made before you know it's, it almost reads if i recall correctly that yahweh had created certain lands for them to inhabit before the fall that's right knowing that there was going to be a fall and then afterwards they're going to be dispersed into their various that's lands. right yeah it's in jubilees 3 28 and 29 and it says and on that day was closed the mouth of all the beasts and of the cattle of the birds and of whatever walks and of whatever moves so they could no longer speak for they had all spoken with one another with one lip and with one tongue and he sent out of the garden of eden all flesh that was in the garden of eden and all flesh was scattered according to its kinds 
and according to its types unto the places which have been created for them. Yeah. So, yep. Like he, I mean, just like we already know, he knew, he knows everything in advance anyway, but yeah, clearly the, the, the circle of the earth was created initially for, to be inhabited by, you know, animals and mankind. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's yeah, interesting. Yeah. There's definitely that there. Um, also looks like, um, I just want to touch real quick on this idea of the firmament uh, it talks about how it rests on the earth, wherever he's taken to at the ends of the earth. Right. Um, and it says the firmament rests on the earth. Now, as we've defined in many, many other uh, uh, episodes, many, many other videos, the firmament is, you know, what this is, what's being used as the word heaven here. And it's actually a physical structure. And uh, from all of our research, or at least from my research, the best I can surmise is some sort of crystalline structure akin to sapphire because uh, sapphire has all the right properties for the way it's described. And that is what it's likened to many, many times by the prophets is that this body of heaven, this structure of heaven is, is like a form of sapphire, but it'd be crystal clear. You could see right through it. Um, it's basically a roof to this place. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the firmament model, right? The firmament creation model. It's just a roof to the, to the place that we live. And, and apparently like all roofs, it has to touch, the thing it's covering, right? It's not yeah, just right. levitating on its own, um, but it's actually, and this is where we get some unique descriptions here. I think in the book of Job, um, Job chapter 26, if we look at verse 10, it says that he has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. And then in verse 11, it says, the foundations of heaven quake and are astonished at his rebuke. And of course, again, heaven means firmament. So I could re easily read Job 26, 11 to say the foundations of the firmament quake and are astonished at his rebuke or astounded. And he, and I think this is the, the similar context in the previous verse, verse 10, that he has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters of the boundary of light and darkness. So this is describing a boundary. Now, the King James actually says he has compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Um, and I think that that's interesting because that would make perfect sense from what we see in Genesis chapter one, where it talks about the darkness that was on the face of the deep. And then he created this day two. He creates the firmament that's above our head and that kind of encloses us. And then in day four, he put the sun, moon and the stars to give us light down upon the ground that we live in. But that would mean outside this firmament. And by the way, I, I don't attest to this, this theory that some people have that the sun, moon and stars are inside the firmament with us. I actually I claim from many other passages in scripture that there's multiple levels of the firmament and the sun, moon, and stars are placed in those multiple levels. But then outside of that basically is darkness, which is why we look up and we see just points of light of the stars and there's darkness all around it. Yeah. But inside this enclosed firmament that we're under is the light that we're given for day and night um, and for signs and seasons. And so that would be this, this boundary, if you will, that separates the light and the darkness being spoken about in Job 26, 10, yeah, that's, in my that's opinion. Funny. No, I, I, I agree, Sean. I don't see the sun, moon, and stars being inside. Like if you're considering the firmament as a bowl, it's kind of underneath the bowl on the top kind of layer. You know what I mean? I don't see that there. In fact, in the Apocalypse of Abraham, which is another really fascinating extra biblical book, guys. Um, I know Sean and I are, are testing it and seeing if it lines up with the scriptures and so far it, it has a thumbs up for me. I, I think it does for you. Right, Sean. Yeah. I've, I've, I don't see hardly anything in that book that would disagree with the canon of 66, but you know, maybe in the future we can do a, a, a short few episodes on that one. Cause it's a pretty small book. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted to read something out of uh, chapter 19, the end of chapter 19 and uh, the sure, start brother, of chapter 20 here. Essentially Abraham, this is the Genesis 15 moment guys, where Abraham is, is instructed to, um, you know, set up a an altar and and cut up all the meat for the sacrifice because Yahweh's going to cut a covenant with him. But in this book, it, it tells us that there's um, there's two birds that he wasn't supposed to to mess with at all to cut up or or you know he was supposed to leave them completely alone. And so he's taken up with an angel on the wings of these birds apparently up to the seventh heaven, so the seventh firmament where Yahweh is, and Yahweh's showing him the different firmaments below. And while he's there, it says in uh, verse 27 here, and he commanded that the sixth firmament should be removed from my sight. And I saw there 
on the fifth firmament, the powers of the stars, which carry out the commands laid upon them, and the elements of the earth obeyed them. And the eternal mighty one said to me, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, here I am. And he said to me, consider from above the stars, which are beneath you and number them for me and make known to me their number. And I said, how can I, for I am but a man of the dust of the earth. And he said to me, as the number of the stars and their power, so will I make your seed a nation and people set apart for me as my own inheritance. And so, and then it goes on. But um, so, yeah, basically, it is, I find it fascinating that we get another interesting detail here that we don't get in the canon um, that tells us that, you know, the, the sun, moon and stars on day number four are placed within the, you know, the Shemaim, right? And that's yeah. plural. So that could be referring to, according to the Apocalypse of Abraham, um, you know, sun, moon, and stars. Not 100% sure where those are. I speculate that they're either above the firmament that we have above our heads or possibly in the second firmament. But um, yeah, according to the Apocalypse of Abraham, the, the stars themselves are in the fifth firmament. Right. So, Which would, and how, how much sense does that make when we've got, you know, astronomy saying, well, you can clearly see that you know stars are further away than the sun. Yeah, no kidding. And they, the, what I'm saying is, they claim that there's depth when they look at the stars, yeah. and that's what they they come up with uh, trigonometric parallax, which is kind of like an astronomy term for trying to calculate the distance between stars in a heliocentric model. And they claim that some stars are further away and some are closer, but yet they magically all have the same sense of perfect size. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they all seem to be the same size from our perspective. You don't, you don't see one that's massively bigger than another. And they all seem to have, you know, um, a very, and I know some of them have different luminosity, but um, it's just interesting to me because supposedly some are like, you know, quadrillion light years away. And then another one like the sun is supposedly 93 million miles away. Yet that's the brighter one. Um, and that's the bigger one. And they, and that, so they're claiming there's depth within this concept. That's right. I personally think from all the firmament model descriptions of scripture and Enoch, that it's just simply the way they're placed in these different layers of the firmament intended literally to shine on us and give that perspective so that it, it's a sense of uniformity, if you will, you know, that's right. Yeah. Um, and it's fascinating, Sean, cause I've seen pictures of, you know, um, astronomers essentially that post their stuff online on, on YouTube that show that the stars are through the moon you can see stars right. through the moon which is fascinating um, yeah well that goes into a whole different concept or a whole different video that we'll have to do in the future about exactly what the moon is you know yeah but yeah so what i've what i've been able to discern on my research regarding the firmaments and where this, the heavenly luminaries are placed within i think you know abraham was shown the fifth firmament that's where the stars are and i personally believe that the the sun and the moon are in the firmament above our heads. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Now, also, as far as the firmament itself, we have uh, passages like Amos 9, 6. It says, um, it talks about how it's it's literally a vaulted dome over the earth. You know, to give people some perspective of what we're talking about when we talk about this firmament model above our heads and these, and these luminaries being inside them. Verse 6 says, the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens, and that's, of course, speaking about God, he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name, or Yahweh is his name. So this is an idea here that he is he's built his upper chambers in the heavens. So in the firmaments, if that's a plural concept there in the Shema name, in the firmaments, he has built his upper chambers and he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. And that's where I said it's like a roof, you know, it's a but specifically it's shaped in in a circular fashion which would make a lot of sense to why it seems from our perspective it seems like we live on a you know on a ball when we look up in space right that's right yeah because yeah, we have second, that perspective of what we're seeing so yeah second ezra actually talks about how the firmament is is an arc upon the waters yeah yeah an arch yeah and what's unique about that is it's incredibly strong that type of architecture makes it incredibly durable to hold up weight above it and not to have supporting pillars all, all throughout it, you know, because of its actual structure is natural to itself. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's an incredibly strong building technique, you know, which would make sense since we, you know, it's God we're talking about. He knows the perfect way to build something like that, you know, for the, the proper proportions of, of weight distribution and everything. That's so right. Would make sense. And 
he's apparently spent an entire day on it in creation. <laughs> yeah, no so it's a big it. deal. It's a big structure because it's a big deal. <laughs> it's right. literally protecting us from from an entire, you know, uh, separate set of things and land and water and mountains and people and entities, the angels and it's the ferment over our heads, according to the ferment model of, of creation is literally protecting us from all this stuff, all this weight and stuff above us. So it doesn't fall down on us. So yeah, he definitely spent an entire day in creation making just that. Yeah. It was very, very important indeed to take your time on this structure. Absolutely. Yeah. So Sean in verse two here, getting back to chapter 33 in Enoch, um, right at the end, it says, He's, uh, you know, where the heaven rests and then the portals of the heaven open. When I think of the word portals, I'm thinking like, you know, sci-fi, like a big kind yeah. of just like a portal opening up and then, psh. but you know, that, that's also, it can simply just mean a doorway or a gate or an entrance, right, Sean? Yeah, exactly. It's just a word used for a doorway yeah. or yeah, some sort of entrance of some sort. So yeah, that's, that's interesting to think about, especially since we know that and during the days of the flood, there were flood gates, right? That had opened up and water had come down. The water that's above the firmament of heaven. Yeah, absolutely. So these are the same type of gates that um, flooded the earth. Are these the same type that are at the end of this earth, in your opinion? So what it seems like to me is that this, the, this actual structure of the firmament has lots of different passageways. You know, lots of different doors and gates that can be opened for different reasons. Yeah. Some for, some for apparently rain. <laughs> and that seems to be what the floodgates are used for. Not, but in the flood, they were just left open, which is what caused flooding from above, right? Too much rain, rain right. for 40 days and 40 nights. But in general, we have all these passages that says the rain comes from the Lord. So right. it makes me wonder if those gates were put there initially from the beginning just to literally give us rain. You know, and I know that in modern uh, science, it's, it's um, you know, evaporation of, of water. They claim it goes up into the air. And then therefore it creates water clouds and moisture. And that's what creates the rain. That could be supplementary to the process. But what if there was also extra moisture being dropped in from above through actual gates intended for this type of enclosed terrarium style creation model? Yeah. So it's just something to consider. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Sean, verse three here where it says, and I saw how the stars of heaven come forth and I counted the portals out of which they proceed and wrote down all their outlets. Are we seeing here um, essentially? I'm trying to understand where what these portals are, these gates that he's seeing the stars come through. Because if we consider, you know, what I was just referring to in the Book of Apocalypse of Abraham, how the uh, the stars would be in the fifth firmament, and 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 we're thinking that he's at the ends of the extremities of the earth on this plane. What's he seeing there, and how's he seeing that in your opinion? of the stars coming out to their courses yeah well, it, it to me it's like i don't know exactly how the optics of a firmament would would look because if they have different portals and gateways and different parts of it is designed for different functions then from his perspective being at the ends of it where it rests on the earth and him looking up to see these portals being open these doorways or gates whatever we want to call them being open where these stars come forth um to go on their courses it's almost i don't know exactly the positioning of what it would look like to him, but he's clearly being able to watch something trans transpire. Something's taking place where he didn't yeah. see them in one moment. And then he's seeing them in another moment and he's given, he's saying they're coming through these portals yeah. to start their course. Yeah. And he saw each individual star by itself going through their own portals, right? According to their number and their names. Yeah. That's a lot. So how long is he standing there? What's going I know, on? Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty insane. Yeah. yeah. Now this is just to the east, so maybe he's just looking at the stars on this side. Because doesn't I think in following chapters he does the same thing in the south. That's right. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting thought. Now another thing I wanted to point out before we move on, Sean, um, where he says that he wrote down each individual star by itself according to the number and their names, their courses and their positions. I had um, posted something on Facebook a, f a few months ago out of Enoch chapter 43, which I think kind of corresponds interestingly with what we're talking about here with, with um, the names that Enoch's writing down. 
I'll just be, I'll just read that real quick. It says, I beheld another splendor in the stars of heaven. I observed that he called them all by their respective names and that they heard. In a righteous balance, I saw that he weighed out with their light, the amplitude of their places and the day of their appearance and their conversion. Splendor produced splendor and their conversion was into the number of the angels and of the faithful. Then I inquired of the angel who proceeded with me and explained to me these secret things, what their names were. He answered, a similitude of those has the Lord of spirits shown you. They are the names of the righteous who dwell upon earth and who believe in the name of the Lord of spirits forever and forever. So basically to set in this meme, which is here on your screen, if you're a covenant believer in Yahweh, there is a star in the heavens that has been named after you since the day the stars were created. And it's fascinating because when you kind of like juxtapose that onto what we're taught today in science that, you know, if you're an astronomer or someone who has a you know access to a telescope of some sort and you discover a star that doesn't have a name you know you can name it essentially and and, and um according to enoch all the stars already have names and they all are named um in accordance with the righteous on the earth with the elect so if you're going to be a resurrected son of god a star has, has already been named after you that's that's pretty amazing right gives a lot more relevance to some things like we actually see verses like that to supplement what you just read as far as what Enoch is putting forth. Uh, I think it's in Psalm 147, um, verse four, where it says that he counts the, the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. And then also uh, Isaiah 40, 26, he talks about lift up your eyes on high who created all these. He leads forth the starry host by number. He calls each one by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is, is missing. So that's, yeah, it's yeah, amazing. It's just, it's just both both uh, Enoch and the other apocryphal book that you, I mean, excuse me, not Enoch. Um, you didn't read from another, both Enoch here in chapter 33 and also 43, uh, right? And that's what that's you're right. reading from, um, are venerated by what we see here in the canon as well in Psalm 147 and Isaiah, 20, Isaiah 40. So it's just um, very interesting. It's another thing to consider, guys, when, um, when you're outside and you have access away from the light pollution of the cities. If you, if you, or someone who can see the skies at night and you're looking up at those stars it just, it's fascinating to think about you know it really one is. of those is, is named after you it's, it's, <laughs> it's a beautiful concept it truly is man it's it's amazing um do you want to pick up 34. yep absolutely sweet man okay and from thence i went towards the north to the ends of the earth and there I saw a great and glorious device at the ends of the whole earth. And here I saw three portals of heaven open in the heaven. Through each of them proceed north winds. When they blow, there is cold, hail, frost, snow, dew, and rain. And out of one portal, they blow for good. But when they blow through the other two portals, it is with violence and affliction on the earth. And they blow with violence. So that kind of corresponds, Sean, with what you were talking about earlier with, you know, the treasuries and the jars kind of, um, you know, it's what we've been taught about winds and, and dew and hail and frost and snow is something completely different according to Enoch, right? That's right. Yeah. And according to the book of Job. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. And what I what's fascinating to me is uh, verse one where he talks about, I saw a great and glorious device at the ends of the whole earth. Now, I know that most people, when they hear that word, um, actually, I'm going to put up on the screen here just the, the jet definitions for that word from General Dictionary. And the first one is just is what most people might think when they hear the word device because of our current modern technological age. They might think it's a thing made or adapted for a particular purpose, especially a piece of mechanical or electronic equipment, like a utensil tool, an apparatus, or a machine of some sort. Um, and then but the second definition, in my opinion, might be a little bit better fit uh talking about it's a plan a scheme or a trick with a particular aim so he may and according i don't know the translator i don't know the original hebrew word but what the translator used this word device at the ends of the earth from what we then see explained to us it's it doesn't doesn't seem like there's an actual electronical or mechanical device it's just that these this is the scheme this is the plan of how these are supposed to work these portals open in the north and then you get this different type of weather patterns yeah, that's right. And that seems the, to be the, the contextual reading, in my opinion, of this. Yeah, I agree. And if um, for those of you who haven't, at Sepper Coffee, um, it actually just says a great wonder. 
Yeah, so. which is very generic. And yeah. but but again, with the following two verses, we see that yeah, it is a wonder because that's you know he's telling us this is how weather happens, and it's from yeah. these portals out of that north. And like that's not what I was taught growing up. <laughs> no, I know. When you take this literally, Sean, yeah. there is a gate yeah. that opens up and you have north winds that blow through that. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to see a meteorologist just pop out one that one day and be like, all right, guys, this next week, it looks like we're getting some strong winds from the portals of the firm firmament of the north. Coming <laughs> sweeping down through Canada. It's going to come into the uh, Mich Michigan area. And uh, guys, this uh, that let through some frost and some cold and there's probably going to be some snow involved. But yeah, I mean, it's just what isn't there an actual uh, like an old joke about old man winter north or something like that? <laughs> there is, yeah, about him being like the the guy that brings the weather. Yeah, what's interesting to me, Sean, is that when I read this, through each of them proceed north winds. When they blow, there is cold hail, frost, snow, dew, and rain. So it's like you get several different aspects yeah. going through one portal, one gate. Right? Yeah. And it's almost like there's there's storms coming and you know and i've heard that a south wind at least growing up anyway um i always heard that a south wind was you knew it was gonna it was about to be hot if you're getting wind blowing from the south right yeah i don't know are are the directional terms that we call north and south the same as what enoch is looking at that's another big question probably for later chapters yeah but when i when i try to put the directions together in this book my compass is spinning in all directions in my <laughs> mind right, like it's just but another interesting thing, Sean, before we get on to the next chapter is in verse three here, it says, and out of one portal, they blow for good. But when they blow through the other two portals, it is with violence and affliction on the earth. So yeah. apparently there's two portals that blow these things that were mentioned in verse two, the, the cold hail, frost, snow, dew, and rain. They blow them violently and with affliction on the earth. But with one portal, they just blow for good. What do you think that means? They blow for good. Just like a yeah. consistent, constant blowing of these things. I have no idea, brother. I don't know if it just means like there's the intensity is different. Um, as and of course, as far as like snowstorms coming in or rainstorms, you know, um, I don't know if if it blows for good, meaning you know, it's just like you said, it's more consistent, but it's less. And it just it's you, your proper weather cycle that helps for growing and agricultural food processing. And you know, but if you get too much, then you got massive storms and problems. I don't know. That's a good question, man. It's a great thing. It's such a small chapter, but there's a lot of stuff packed in here. That's right. It really is. Um, right. I'm going to read 35. One of the next chapter. Yeah, verse 30, or chapter 35 just says one verse. It's real small. It says, And from thence I went towards the west to the ends of the earth, and I saw there three portals of the heaven open, such as I had seen in the east, the same number of portals and the same number of outlets. This is interesting because he actually expounds upon the portals and calls them outlets yeah yeah that's interesting but he doesn't say about anything coming out of them in the west yeah well it's it's interesting because there's three portals from where he came from previously and then he goes here there's another three it almost seems like there's you know three six does it, does he does it say that he goes to this to the south yeah that's the next yeah. chapter okay and there's three and portals. there's three well, yeah there's, three so we got... each side. there's 12 total portals so it's almost like a clock yeah that's interesting. Yeah. And there's also 12 gates on each four sides of the New Jerusalem. Mm hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that there's these three portals in the West, but there's nothing spoken of them. It doesn't, doesn't see what they do. I wonder if it just, you know, the implication with this is that it's pretty much the same as where he just came from. Well, he's, uh, he's going to talk about here in chapter 36, verse one, he talks about the portals of the South and that they also bring dew, rain and wind. So maybe we yeah. just jump over there. Sure. You want to read the 36? Absolutely. And from thence I went to the south to the ends of the earth and saw there three open portals of the heaven. And thence there came dew, rain, and wind. And from thence I went to the east to the ends of the heaven and saw here the three eastern portals of heaven open and small portals above them. Through each of these small portals pass the stars of heaven and run their course to the west on the path which is shown to them. And as often as I saw, I blessed always the Lord of glory. And I continued to bless the Lord of glory, who has wrought great and glorious wonders, to show the greatness of his works to the angels and to the spirits and to men, that they might praise his work and all his creation, that they might see the work of his might 
and praise the great work of his hands and bless him forever. Okay, so two two things stick out to me. And the first one is there seems to be actually more than just three portals in the south. Yeah, you get three above three small ones above it. Yeah. And that's where the, the angel or the uh, stars pass through. So it's like there's six portals here. Well, let's just let's just think about proportions here, Sean, for a second. All right. Yeah. So we're told earlier on in, in Enoch that there were seven rebellious stars, luminaries, and they looked like burning mountains. So if a star is the size of a mountain, let's say, let's just, you know, what's a good size average mountain, Sean, that we can <laughs> use for this? That's let's hard, just say man. Mount Everest, okay? If a star is the size of Mount Everest, and these portals have to obviously be big enough for them to go through, right? And yeah. this is referring to smaller portals but yeah. above the ones below it. So these portals, man, these are massive things. <laughs> these are, this is a huge creation model we're looking at. I mean, this is no, no joke. This is, and, and no wonder when the heavens tremble at his rebuke, as Job 30, uh, 26, 11 talked about that. And, and by the way, I, I believe personally that that particular verse is talking about the day of the Lord, that the heavens tremble at his rebuke because he's, he's rolling it back like a scroll which causes this massive earthquake, which affects the ground, because as we read in Enoch 31, 2, the firmament sits down on the ground. And so um, that's why if you mess with the firmament, it's such a massive structure, the whole earth is going to shake. The whole land that we live on is going to shake. That's, yeah, I, I agree with you, man. That's definitely what the, the context is of that. And so, yeah, as you're talking about, man, the proportions of this firmament is massive. I mean, again, it took him all of creation. He spent an entire day just on this thing. So yeah, it's massive, yeah. very massive. Uh, the second thing that sticks out to me though, is that uh, at the beginning of this, where it says, um, or excuse me, at the end of this verse, at the end of four, where it talks about uh, that, so that they might praise his work and all his creation, that they might see the work of his might and praise the great work of his hands and bless him forever. Isn't there a passage in, uh, I think it's like Psalm, um, is it Psalm 19? I think it is Psalm 19. Yeah, where it talks about the, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yeah, we go there real quick and read it. And I think there's another passage in Job eight as well that that mentions this concept. So in Psalm nineteen, it says, "I can go there real quick." Um, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and there and the firmament is declaring the work of His hands. So we've kind of have a you know reiteration of what we just read here in Enoch you know, thirty six four, yeah, and uh, let me go to Job eight. I think it's in Job eight. Testing my Job memory right now. Mm. Or let me see here, Job nine eight. But it also talks about the the handiwork of him. Basically, how it, it tells of his glory. Yeah, Sean, while you're looking for that, man, there was something that I found interesting in that um, same verse, verse 4 there, where it says that, um, and I continue to bless the Lord of glory who has wrought great and glorious wonders to show the greatness of his work to the angels. So you have one, angels, and to spirits, two, and to yeah. men, three. You, and that's interesting. That too, huh? Yeah, and I found that interesting because, you know, angels are spirits and yahweh is the lord of spirits and he is the spirit himself and what's fascinating i, I don't keep referring back to the apocalypse of abraham abraham was shown while he was on the seventh firmament guys where yahweh is there was a fiery multitude of angels that surrounded yahweh's throne and we know that in in other passages within the scriptures so you know that corresponds well with that but then when he looked down to the firmament below his feet in the sixth firmament you have what and it says in verse 26 of chapter 19 and i looked down from the mountain on which i stood to the sixth firmament and there i saw a multitude of angels of pure spirit without bodies whose duties so whose duty was to carry out the commands of the fiery angels who were upon the seventh firmament so that's fascinating to me because <laughs> you know we're learning that there's there's different layers there's different firmaments and there's different 
um, entities contained within each firmament. Yeah. It's a home for each of them, right? It really is, yeah. And and whatever these spiritual beings are, they can they can seemingly possess different looks. Like, you know, they can they can change their forms. And I think we read that also in um Second Ezra, as well as Book of Enoch itself, you know, talked about it previous chapters, how the angels assume many different forms. That's I think right. We covered that in a few episodes back, but um that's yeah, it's just fascinating. It's fascinating because apparently we in this, and I don't want to go too far with this, but there, isn't there a place in, um, is it Baruch or Ezra? So it talks about those who are in the resurrection will be like the angels and able to assume different forms. Second Baruch. Yep. It's amazing. Isn't that wild? So that would make a lot of sense with what we see with Yeshua after his resurrection, where he is um, able to kind of disguise himself in a way that they didn't recognize him. Yeah. But then he, then the moment they broke bread, and this is in Luke 24, the two guys walk into Emmaus. He kind of straddles up alongside them, and they start talking as they're walking to Emmaus. Have this wonderful conversation. The two guys are, you know, which I believe are two of his disciples, even though it doesn't really name them. They're just they're amazed. Their hearts are burning with fire because he's explaining the scriptures to them, it's like that feeling you and I get, Ken, when we just dig into the word. And then they go to break bread with him and have dinner with him. And then the moment he breaks the bread, he disappears, and they realize apparently they recognized him at that point. And I don't know. I just don't know if that's some of that power happening at this time where he's literally disguising himself in a way until then he lets them recognize him because he kind of changes back to what he normally looked like. Yeah. I, I don't I, know. It's hard. Yeah, man. I've, I've heard different theories. I think uh, the late great Chuck Missler had an interesting theory regarding um, Yeshua and Mary in the garden just after he had resurrected and um, why she thought him to be the gardener at first. And, um, you know, he had he had speculated it's because his his beard was torn out and he was so marred up that, you know, his his resurrection body would have kind of just it would have had all sorts of scars all over him. Right. Interesting theory. Very yeah. interesting. But I think very that, romantic theory along the lines of romanticism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. I think that what you know, what you were saying there, Sean, um, with the details that were told in Second Baruch and um in other passages, it, it, I believe Yeshua was able to just change his form completely. And so uh, that, that could have been the same thing with Mary. Yeah. Just like two guys at the run of it to Emmaus. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's very possible if we're getting these descriptions of angels correctly. And in, you know, Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, 29, you know, at the resurrection, we'll be like the angels. So exactly. Now, We'll be greater than them in authority, but as far as the physics of our body's makeup, we'll be like the angels, you know, and that's, yeah. that's an interesting promise of the first resurrection. So, amen. Um, what else is in this chapter you, that stuck out to you, brother? Um, I think we pretty much covered what I wanted to discuss. Yeah. Cause I think we we're wanting to save the, the next chapter, I think till next week. Right. Yeah, because we actually start to get into um, where it mentions the Messiah, and that's as if I'm not mistaken. Did you want to stop? It's, it would be the, it would be the, the following chapter after the next. Did you want to do thirty seven or stop here? Why don't we stop here? I think I think the next chapter would be a great chapter to start off with yeah. for for a new episode, especially because it gives us a little bit of a, a recap of the family bloodlines and the incest. Yeah, yeah, that way which would be very fitting if we're going to lead into an introduction of the righteous one. Yeah. yeah and, and Ken, I think, um, man, this, these have been some fascinating little chapters, a lot of stuff packed into them. A uh, lot of easy similarities with the canon of 66, which I think is just another huge step in the direction of, of venerating the book of Enoch, that it maybe it should not have been taken out of the canon of 66 and that whoever did it um, either did not have the best intentions or just wasn't actually a biblical scholar. That's really kind of what it, what my heart feels is one of those two reasons. And either of those two reason, reasons are bad reasons <laughs> to take this book out of the canon of 66. Yeah, I fully agree, man. It's it, it, I'm bewildered by why they would do such a thing unless it's the two reasons that you just mentioned. Yeah, like there's either they're trying to intentionally hide them, which, by the way, you know, the word apocryphal just means hidden. So even to call them the apocryphal books is giving away the idea that they're intentionally. Why would you try to hide them? Bring them out to the light. Let them let people test them. 
So that's what we're doing here in honor of Kings. Thank you for joining us for this episode here, episode 10. Next week, guys, come back. We're going to have, we're going to jump into where Enoch starts really going in on the Messiah and explaining and prophesying about the Messiah to come. And uh, man, it's going to be a lot of fun, guys, because, you know, this is one of the, the huge theological component pieces of why Enoch should be in the canon is he's going to give us all these descriptions about the Messiah and we're going to test them according to what we have in the canon of 66. Hey, also, guys, um, uh, Ken Heiderbrecht, my co-host here, he actually is a musician. He has several CDs that are out. And as you saw at the beginning of this episode here, um, this is actually the new cloth. This is new album that he's released. And it's and uh, I just want to encourage you guys to go to the website and check out his music. He writes incredibly awesome praise music. And much of it is theologically sound, which is what I love. Uh, I would say all of it is theologically sound, to be honest, which is what I love because, you know, there's so much uh, praise music out there that you just you have a hard time singing along with because you know that it doesn't line up with scripture, but it has a great tune, a great melody. Thankfully, Ken has the best of both worlds. It's sound, it's sound theologically and it's amazing music to listen to uh, at any time of day, no matter what mood you're in. It's gonna it's gonna point your thoughts and heart toward the Father. So he's the Father's really blessed him. And uh, yes, you go check this out. It's the new cloth, his new CD coming out. Otherwise, come back next week and we'll see you guys here next week. Thanks, guys. Things will be just as they should